Shino nguwa yesi yesi ndino gara nebanga. Ndakatura banga kudai. Ndakatura banga. Ndakatanga kucheka kudai. So kucheka kwa ndiru kita kudai. Ndakawana kutidombo ili lakangariri kubuma kubezwa. E, inini pakutanga ndakanga ndichiweza miti. Shino sa ndakawana kutidombo lakangariri kubuma kucheka sa kucheka kwa ita ili. E, ndakasukera ndiri kutamba na ropungwa isa tia uya. The dialogue began. The stone accepted. From then on, the need for talking to stones has never left Jora Marika. This is the possible begin for a new sculpture. Finding the right piece of rock, Mariga is often on the hunt for stones in quarries all over Zimbabwe. The stone has to have a good shape and no cracks. The chosen rocks are brought to his home. They might have to wait for years before they are finally selected for the next scout. Some of the stones have a natural base. Some others require one to be made. It needs a special state of mind for Jora Mariga to talk to the stone, to explore what potential it has. When he's upset with someone or is depressed, he cannot calm. In the mountain area of Nyanga in eastern Zimbabwe, where Joram discovered the first stone, he has found much inspiration. This includes the farm Bukut, where a number of Zimbabwe scouts have worked. The formation of rocks are a never-ending stream of inspiration. They give the peace of mind that is necessary for scouts. The area continues to attract many artists. Ma tombo a kambira imo momu ma komo imo mo mamuacho aka umbika. Nimfanan <laughs> Jola has lived most of his life close to nature, his source of inspiration. But never so close as in Yang, where he once built his house in a barber tree. Another endless stream of images of different forms. to nature is perhaps one of the reasons why his sculptures from Zimbabwe are so successful internationally. Roy Guthrie, who has the biggest gallery in Zimbabwe and often exhibits abroad, has met that experience. I think the world generally is going back to natural things. They relate very much to the to the way the, the sculpture is worked. Uh, the sculptors don't most of them have no formal training, like Joram. He has to have no formal training. He is not inhi inhibited by things which have been taught to him. He works completely naturally. He looks at a stone, sees an image, has a confidence in his technical skill to pick up his tools and extract that image. And he's not inhibited as so many of us Westerners are in expressing himself. From the time he started with soapstone, Joram has tried as many different types of rock as he has been able to find in Zimbabwe. Many would not lend themselves to carving, but some produce stunning results. One is the lepidolite, which has an almost gemstone-like quality to it when it is finished. Many of his sculptures are made of serpentine, which is the most popular stone among sculptors in Zimbabwe. But Joram has constantly sought new challenges and aimed at working in harder stones. 
He has also worked in the very harder stones available and again uh, said to people, don't work in all this soft stone which can be reproduced so many times. Create works of art every time you do a uh, work. Joram's first experience of carving was with wood at the age of nine years, and he still makes sculptures in wood. Zinokweza kwanda afita mitike chipirikana, chikoro. Chokuti, Vishidi, Varekuku is a Pugazakuti, Matombondu Ega, and Kwanzakuti, Van Vemusibabu Vanga Shantis. Jora Marika sees his role very much as a teacher. He has taught his sons and family and many other people too. Every new road he is going for himself, he seems to it that others follow the same route. So, yes, he's, he's very well known and very highly respected, and that's the other aspect of his, uh, his influence nowadays, is that he is uh, regarded as a uh, father of the community. Uh, some people regard him as the father of Zimbabwe stone sculpture. When Jora Mariga carved his first stone in Nyanga, he did not keep the knowledge to himself. He immediately set up a kind of school where he trained others. Some of his students, like John Takawira, became very famous. Others, like Jonathan Matimba, stayed in Nyanga and still sculpt as a hobby. In Chitungwiza, close to the capital of Harare, lives Moses Masai, who was also one of Mariga's students. He is now an internationally successful artist. Another place where Joram's influence is still felt is Tengenenge, a village of sculptors in the Gruwe region in Zimbabwe. Tom Bloomfield started the village with his farm laborers in the 60s. Crispin Chakanyuka, who had been a student of Joram Marik, came over here and imparted the skills that he had learned from Marik. Many other people joined Tengenenge, including artists from other African countries. The different cultural identities are until now a constant source of creativity. Tom Bluefield is still grateful to Joram Mariga for his support in the beginning. Well, I feel I feel that people people regard him as uh, as like a, like the old man of the old man of, of sculpture. He's like a kind of a. A sort of, you know, for most, you know, the, the uh, pe people people realize that, that he was very, very important in the beginning because he he was the, the first one to make to bring an awareness of the stone sculpture into the into the cultural field. Tengenenge is a very dynamic place today, with over 10,000 sculptures exhibited, all by artists who have never seen an art school. The villages given to outstanding artists like Henry Munyaradzi and Fanizani Akuda, who both later moved to Harare, while Bernard Matemera is still working here. Jora Marika, although he has never worked in Tengenenge, is undoubtedly one of its spiritual mentors. We are going to be a part of the world, and we are going to be a part of the world. Chaganyanira kudi kwa mai, nguli mai lakini kwa singa zuri re kuumbahari, sino ndoka kwa nyanya kuandira shaviracho, pakufunga kuangu inini. Sculptures in clay are one of the historic roots of stone sculpture in Zimbabwe. With clay, it was quite easy to play around with forms, when one was anyway making pots for daily use. <laughs> Many people in Zimbabwe believe that for being a good craftsman, you need a spiritual blessing. 
And this kind of blessing very much comes through inheritance. Like the art of pottery, which is normally inherited by the daughters in the family. <laughs> We believe that uh, if I am a good hunter and I die, I will inspire my descendants and somebody descending from me will end up a good hunter. And after his death, that will be inherited by the next and it goes on and on and on. In other words, it is a skill that will never die out of my, my, my line. Likewise, carving and any form of art is inherited that way and we believe it doesn't die out. It might very well be that some of Jura Mariga's family carvings ended up in a European or American museum with a little sign saying Shona tribe before 1890. But at that time, artists and their families were very respected and among the wealthiest of the people. Their customers would travel far to get that special beautiful walking stick or that outstanding fine mad goods, which is a blanket made out of tree bark. People did not make any difference between an artisan and an artist. Wealthy customers went for the gifted artisans who could demand much in exchange for their work. Usaka inini se kufunga kwangu, nuku wana kwangu. Dinoti vani, iwa mbiri yawe ya kango fanana, ne ili pachurungu. Varungu se suwae se haku babanyo le rapazi. When explorers and settlers came to Zimbabwe, they did not appreciate the traditional artist. Just the opposite. Schools taught children that they should not associate themselves with traditional religion, which is closely connected to the arts. Only in the late 1950s, when the liberation movements began to gain influence, had been so successful that it needed enlightened white people to tell the artists that they had something to offer. For Jora Mariga, it was Pat Pierce, an older lady who lived in Nyanga. <laughs> The other person who was important for Joram at that time was Frank McKeown, the first director of the National Gallery in the then Rhodesia. Inini soko muona na kumufungi zira, muno wakanga ashifarira, zino zine gazi rwa nevano wa tema. Kuta azishamba aze kunyika ozo kunze kuti, ze muno omu zizika nungo kuti, kunyika iyo ii yedu ye rudisha ii, ya kanga ishi mbonzi pa kutanga rudisha. The ruling white minority was not very pleased with Makiwa, and he had to leave the country. But he had set a mark in the history of art. With the first exhibitions in England in the 60s, the world began to know what exceptional sculptors were living in Zimbabwe. Traditionally, the white uh, population, which is only a very small part of our population, I mean, there are 100,000 whites in 12 million blacks, uh, so uh, traditionally they also have not appreciated this work. And uh, when McEwen first started to say this is the greatest art being produced in this country, many were offended by that. With the isolation of Rhodesia after the unilateral declaration of independence and later the beginning of the liberation struggle in the 70s, life for the artists became difficult. They lost their access to foreign markets and Tengenenge had to close down as it became too dangerous to live there. That all changed rapidly with the 80s. 
After independence in 1980, one international exhibition, just the next one. Many of the artists have been overseas to present their works. The world looks with admiration at the artistic expression of Zimbabwe. The foreigners are the big buyers of Zimbabwean sculptures. But can they appreciate what they stand for? when they, in their daily life, have such a distance to the African continent and Africans. So you find a, a professor of metallurgy or whatever at, a, at an exhibition in, in, in Australia or in Germany breaking down. He's so moved by the work. And it still has that quality to move people. It is not inanimate. It's from the stone through to what the artist puts into it, it becomes a real living piece of art. Joram sees himself as a part of history. Therefore, he's carving for excellency and eternity in his art. He wants that his grandchildren can appreciate what he has created. The stones he's using must be very hard so they don't crack or wither away in the years to come. Kusaka Kamesi Jika no continuing in the putin in pretty gadiras in Trofan Rutti Gadiri, Tichisia Karungano, canoes of Fundua, Nevanos, we are Kutimaria Gangati, Ubisa is we salata. This sense of being part of history has other forms. Mariga has already chosen to be buried here in Vukuto, one of the cradles of modern Shona sculpture in Zimbabwe. This horror in Dipano. These mountains have been in former times the burial places of chiefs in the area. No kuti anengar kusakutu umambo wake kanakutu ubaba wake. Why now? Ndi kanovi guam. Before a sculpture gets its final life of its own, it goes through being sanded and washed. Most of the outside will be smooth. The roughness of the former shape has vanished. Soon, it is a thing by itself and expresses a whole range of human experience. In the final stage, the sculpture is heated with fire and wax is applied in order that it shines. Only after the purification of the fire will it be allowed to enter a new world which is totally independent of its creator, Joram Marika. Thank you.